Hello, and uh, thank you all for coming today and to the, to the uh, South Bro Senior Center um, for the presentation series that I do here. For those of you who haven't been here, my name is Arthur Bergeron. I work at a law firm called Myrick O'Connell. There are 70 of us now, or maybe 71. It keeps growing. Uh, and as a result, everybody there gets to do what they like to do because there's enough work for that to happen. And I do nothing but elder law. Uh, as you may know, um, what I try to do is I do four presentations here every year. I try to do the spring ones as more general presentations and then the fall ones on more specific topics. So the first one was Elder Law 101, which was really designed to let you get updated on any changes that have occurred or new things that I have learned this year. We're always learning. Um, but it was also focused on couples. And so I've realized over the, over the years that inevitably at the end people say, How come? I'm not a couple, I'm a single, how do I, you know, what do I do? And so I've started doing this Elder Law 102, which, which is really more focused on singles. So I want to talk about, I talk about issues that may affect you, changes that have occurred, or things that I have learned this year. So uh, you've, if you've seen my presentation, you're all familiar with my friends Frank and Mary. Uh, and their children, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. They're, they're in a later slide. Frank and Mary, uh, they have three children, and they, their goal in life is very simple. They want to live in their house till they die. They want to be buried in the backyard. And, and in terms of their estate plan, we're going to talk about that, but it's basically if one of them dies, they want to leave everything to the other. And if the two of them have died, they want to leave everything to their kids. Does that sound like kind of a familiar kind of plan? Right. So, um, uh, so in this presentation, though, you know, Frank, in all of the presentations is just Frank. So it, whether Fred, Frank was a, was a hero to Mary or was a devil, or the main thing is that in this presentation, he's just a memory because he died. So now it's just Mary. And the question is, what does Mary need to be dealing with? If she comes in to talk to me, what does she need to be dealing with if it's not an emergency and she's talking to a lawyer? And typically she'll tell me, oh, don't I really need a will? Don't I need, really need a trust? Well, we're going to talk about that a little bit later on. But what she really needs, really, really, are those three things. She, she wants to be dealing with life, with her life. She wants to be dealing with her death. She wants to be dealing with what remains. She's got these three children, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. And I'm sorry that you may have trouble seeing these because we can't shut off these lights because otherwise the camera can't see me. I'm so, but, but you've got all these in your handouts. And so we're not assuming that these kids are wonderful and we're not assuming in this case that these kids are terrible. This is not about a family feud situation, which we have talked about. Um, we're just assuming that it's just Mary and she's trying to figure out once what happens once she becomes a memory also. Um, so the th only things that she needs while she's alive are those four things. She needs a, a power of attorney, she needs a health care proxy, she needs a HIPAA, a HIPAA authorization, and she needs a care plan. That's really all she needs. And we're going to talk about those, for, we're going to talk about those for a while. So the power of attorney. Remember that when you're doing a power of attorney, as opposed to when you're doing a healthcare proxy, you can name more than one person at a time. And in Mary's situation now with Frank dead, it may very well be that that's what she's gonna do. She may wanna name two of her kids as opposed to just one of them, uh, jointly and severally. Jointly and severally means either one of them can act on her behalf. They don't both have to sign. <coughs> Excuse me, now there may be some cases where you wanna have both people have to sign. I was just talking to some folks yesterday and they are, they've been married for 30 years, but before that they were both married before. They both brought kids to the marriage. Their goal is that when they both die, they want things divided among all of the kids, kind of 50%, 50-50. But in the meantime, if, if they want to make sure that if there are decisions being made on behalf of one of them and the other one isn't around, that these decisions are going to be made jointly by one person from one family and one person from another. So that's what they're doing. They're naming these people jointly. But it can be jointly and severally. Ought to be less than five years old. Doesn't have to be. Uh, just like it ought to be um, notarized. Power of attorney ought to be notarized. Doesn't have to be legally. The only reason why you want it to be new and you want it to be notarized is because the person who's deciding whether the power of attorney is valid is not me or another lawyer or a judge. It's like the lady at the bank that you're in line and your son is in line saying he wants to start signing your checks and wants to file the power of attorney or the insurance company or normal people and they're seeing an old document or they're seeing one that's not notarized and like, is this really valid? So the reason why you're having the document notarized is not because it, it makes it valid, but because it makes everybody think it's valid. Now I know that sounds stupid, but this is the practical seminar. That's what you need to do. Finally, remember, um, that if you, you can always revoke your power of attorney. You can always cancel it. 
And legally, you do that by notifying the person whom you named. But as a practical matter, if you do that, you also want to go talk to the folks at your bank or wherever you have money. And the reason for that is that in the, in the power of attorney that you may very well already have, there is typically a provision to help your person, to help your person you've named, deal with all these third parties. Because once again, if he, say your son is going to the bank with your power of attorney, and the bank teller is saying, well, how do I know that this hasn't been revoked? Because you can always revoke the power of attorney, right? Or, or how do I know your mother's not dead or your father's not dead? So there's usually a paragraph in there that says that if I, the attorney, sign an affidavit, a statement, or even not even a sworn statement, doesn't even have to be notarized, right? If I sign a statement that says that this power of attorney has not been revoked and that the, the person who signed it is not dead, well, then that person can deal with me, whether it's the bank person or the guy from your UBS investment account or any of these folks can deal with me, knowing that if I was lying, they're protected. They're protected. They have no liability. Which means that if you've revoked the power of attorney because you don't trust somebody who's got the power of attorney, you want to make sure they don't do that, that they don't then go to the bank and pull out all your money. So you need to go talk to the bank and talk to the insurance company and the other people who this person may go see with the power of attorney to tell them that it's been revoked, right? Or to maybe sign something that says that it's been revoked. The healthcare proxy and the HIPAA authorization. A, the purpose of a healthcare proxy, I just want to mention this, it's really important, is very narrow. If you've named somebody who is your proxy, then that means that if a doctor later determines that you can't make a medical decision, then that person gets to make medical decisions for you. Until your doctor has said that you can't make a medical decision, that proxy is not in, in effect. And the person you've named has no power, which means, say you go to the hospital and you named your daughter as your proxy, and, or your son, and now you're in the hospital, and you know, you're, you're, you know, you're, you're fine, you're in the room, you know, you're maybe feeling not great though, right? And so you really don't want to be necessarily talking to the doctor, checking with the hospital, seeing if the operations are going to go. You don't want to do all that stuff. But since you're still competent, your proxy is not in effect. So that daughter or son that you named can't talk to any of those officials because unless the proxy is in effect, the person with the proxy can't talk to them unless you've done a HIPAA authorization. That is an authorization to your doctors in, your hospital, in the hospital. And this can be written as a generic document, a document that applies to all of your doctors and hospitals that says, talk to this person. It's okay to talk to this person and show them my records. Now, the other reason you may want to do that, and this often happens, folks will come in to me and they'll say, I don't want to just have one of my kids on my proxy, I want to have them all. And I'll say, no, well actually no, you can't do that, right? Law says you can only have one proxy at a time. The reason for that is simple. If I'm the doctor, I don't want to hear two kids arguing about how to take care of you, right? I want to talk to one person and that's the person I'm going to communicate with. So, so but, but what you can do is you can name, you know, one child as the first in the event that that child isn't doing it, you can name the second one. But you can also give them both um, HIPAA authorizations, authorizations to allow both of them to talk to the doctor or the hospital. This is really important if your kids are all over the place. We have three kids. One's in Washington, D.C., she's my lawyer. Uh, one's in Austin, Texas, she's my designer. And one's in Colorado Springs, he's going to be my, my medical guy, right? But the point is, if we really get sick, if my wife and I really get sick, they're all gonna wanna know what's going on, right? And if everybody's got an authorization, then everybody can, can they don't have to just rely on the one daughter who, is, who is, has the, is, the, is the proxy as the filter for everything, okay? So you want that, so you want the medical authorization, that authorization applies immediately. You know, you don't have to be incapacitated for the authorization to apply. Now, if you're Mary, and you have these kids, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. Um, and your goal is to live in your house until you die and be buried in the backyard. And your goal, uh, and, and, and for purposes of the rest of the presentation, we're gonna use these as, the, as her figures for assets and income. So Mary owns a house, it's worth $400,000, right? It's not a really big house, not, not, a, not around here anymore, $400,000. Um, an IRA she's got that's worth three hundred thousand. She's got an, a, a an annuity worth three hundred thousand. She's named the kids as the death beneficiaries. She's got a bank account worth a hundred thousand. The total is a million one. 
I needed to, you've, usually when I use this example, it's below a million, but I want to talk to you about estate taxes, so I needed to get it above a million. Um, she, uh, she has not a lot of income, Social Security, 2000 pension, $500 a month, right? So that's her situation. Um, does she need a will? Well, no, actually, she doesn't. She doesn't really need a will, because remember, if she, if, if she dies, her goal was simply to divide up all the assets among the kids. Now, if she dies without a will, then the rules that get applied in the probate court say, you divide up all the assets among the kids. So it's the same thing. It's the same thing. So she doesn't actually need a will, unless she, um, her kids have maybe a problem, right? And let, if one of them has a money problem, for example, I mean, because she doesn't want to really leave that share to the creditors of her son, she wants to leave it to her son, right? Or if they've got a marriage problem, because she doesn't really want to leave that share to the daughter-in-law she never liked in the first place, because they're going to get a divorce after she dies, you know, and now all of a sudden that money is in play because she left it to him. Or she doesn't want to leave it, to, it, it just to him if he's got a disability. Say he's got, say he's on, and because he may, either because he now is or may later be on mass health or other means-tested programs, so that the effect of leaving him something is to knock him off the program or make him ineligible, right? In all of those cases, she probably wants to have a will that contains a trust provision that says that what would have gone to that child will instead go in trust for the benefit of that child. Typically, she would name one of her other kids, hopefully the one that gets along with that child, to be the trustee. Um, and as long as she does that, and as long as the child who is the beneficiary does not have the right to order the transfer of the money to him, then the creditors can't force him to transfer the money, the wife or the husband, the divorcing person can't make that part of the estate, and it's not going to be a countable asset for purposes of qualifying for or staying on mass health or other programs. So there may be that kind of reason why she wants to do it, but otherwise, if, there, if there's no will, the assets simply get divided among the kids. But wait, you're saying, if I have a will, doesn't that avoid probate? Well, no, no. The probate process applies to any asset that you die owning just in your name where you haven't already named a death beneficiary. The most common one is the house. In the Frank and Mary case, one person dies, the house is owned jointly so that upon that person's death, it instantly goes to the other spouse. But then if the other spouse dies the next day, has to go through probate. Probate, the purpose of probate is to figure out who owns things that you own when you die. Um, so the question really is not, do you need a, a will versus no will, in this case at least, right? The question is, do you want to avoid probate? Now, of course, avoiding probate does nothing for you because you're going to be dead. So the real question is, do you want your kids to avoid probate? Why would they want to avoid probate? Well. The probate process always takes about a year, at least a year. And the reason for that is that, the, the, that your creditor, be, the probate process is designed to make sure that the right people get the money. It's also designed to make sure that before the money gets distributed, it gets, if there are creditors, the creditors get paid. The creditors always get paid first, include taxes, whatever. And, and all those creditors have one year from the date of your death to file a claim against the probate estate. But the claim is only good against the probate estate, right? So if you want to your, have your kids not have to waste that year before things get divided up, if you want to have them not have to pay, right now, the cost of probate in a, a straightforward case like this where the kids aren't fighting and everything's going smoothly, about $4,000 in legal fees, right? So if you don't want to have to pay the $4,000, it's not a big number, but it's not nothing, you know? Um, or, and, uh, if you want them to just be able to sell the house, if you have a house, without having to get court approval, because that court approval is going to cost them some time and also cost them more legal money, then you may want to try to avoid the probate process, right? Now, if you're married, there are several ways you can do that. One is you can make sure that all of your assets, are, like in the Frank and Mary case, are owned jointly. So that, you, so that you take your bank accounts and you take your house and whatever you have that you own that would otherwise go through probate, and you say, okay, I'm gonna name my, this is really ideal when you have one child, you know, I'm gonna name that, that child as the joint owner of these properties so that when I die, legally, my interest will evaporate and the other joint owner will become the sole owner, right? And that all works great. And that is the cheapest way 
to the to is it's called it's got the poor man, poor man's probate process right poor, poor man's estate planning you just get everything into joint names now it may be or in or in the case of the the uh, the house there's another option called a life estate you can transfer this interest in the house to your kids right now through a deed but you keep a so-called life estate in the house that is control of the house until you die and then upon your death that interest evaporates and the other person becomes the sole owner of the house so that may work great, right? There are a couple of things that, that may dissuade you from doing that. One, it, it, you really have to, to trust the person that you're putting as the joint owner on this stuff, right? Like regarding the bank account, because of course that means they can get all the money because they're the joint owner. They can just walk in without your signature and get the money. Um, the, the second thing is, if they've got creditors, the creditors, now they own half the house and they own half of the money. And so if there's a creditor, the creditor can attach those assets, right? So the assets are now, are now vulnerable. Um, another, another example, specifically regarding the house, this is often a concern. There's a, once again, you have this device through which you can transfer an interest to the house and keep a life estate. And I've, had, I've done that a number of times around here. It's, as I say, it's the, if that's only asset is your house and you only got one child, so you know that when you die, the kids aren't going to fight about this, right? Then you do this. But I had two situations. Both occurred, interestingly, in Martha's Vineyard. I go, to, I go to the islands every Thursday. I either go to Martha's Vineyard or Nantucket. I have trouble sometimes explaining to the other 69 partners that this is really work, that I have to go to Martha's Vineyard tomorrow, and then, oh, Nantucket next week. How sad. But anyway, there was one person, the lady called me, older lady, who had done this transfer a number of years before of the house and kept a life estate. And five years had gone by, and so for mass health purposes, the house was safe if she needed nursing home care. I'm going to talk about that later. But she said, do I have a problem? She said, my son just called me. It was just one child. My son just called me. His wife is suing for divorce. I said, ooh, you got a problem. Now you got a problem, right? Because the son owns the remainder interest in the house. There's this chart that the federal government uses to, to allocate values, how much of the value of the house is with the remainder interest and how much in the life estate. And the older you get, the smaller the life estate value is because the less you're gonna live and the bigger the remainder interest. So this lady was about 80. So the remainder interest was about 80% of her house in Vineyard Haven of the $800,000 house. Cause it's not a big house, but it's in Vineyard Haven, right? And I said that 80%, that $640,000 is gonna be in play in that divorce, right? Cause the son owns it. Second example, uh, another house, um, another case on Martha's Vineyard, people had moved there many years before from Boston and had transferred the remainder interest, in this case, to their three kids and had kept a life estate. And they'd been going along, actually lived there for 20 years. It was a cottage that they converted. They loved, they loved um, like many, they loved Martha's Vineyard. So now they're in their 80s and they don't want to, they're still both healthy, but they don't want to live on Martha's Vineyard anymore. They want to be closer to their grandchildren because you know, it's Martha's Vineyard. So like the healthcare, if you get really sick on Martha's Vineyard in Nantucket, you're a long ways away from like, you know, top flight healthcare, right? You're a plane away. And a lot of times the planes aren't running, right? And so as you get older, that's kind of the reason why a lot of people move back, right? So she, they said, we want to sell our house. Well, in order for them to sell their house and take advantage of the capital gains exemption, um, the, this remainder interest has to be retransferred to them because to get the capital gains exemption, which you've all heard of, the, in the case of a couple, $500,000, so they could sell their house, which they bought for 50, you know, for, and now it's worth a million so that they can you know, get a reduction. The, the, the remainder has to be retransferred to them and then they have to keep living in the house for another two years because you only get the exemption if you've owned and, and been the, living in the house for two of the previous five years. So they talked to their three kids, and two of the kids were fine, but the other one wasn't. The other one said, oh, no, I don't want to do that. Ooh, they, so they called me. What do we do? What do we do? I said, there's nothing you can do. Kid owes the remainder interest. You can't sell the house without his interest. But what if we, can we go to court? I said, yeah, you could go to court, file something called a petition to partition real estate, and the court will order a sale of the house and divide up the money. But remember, your life estate's only worth 20% of the value of this million dollar house. So you get 200,000, but the, others, the kids get the rest, right? They said, oh, what about if, we, how about if we get a reverse mortgage? Because you know, one of their issues too was living on the island was expensive. I said, you can do that, but the kids are all gonna have to sign, right? Because they've got the remainder interest. So 
this is just all by way of saying, th this is the cheapest way of doing it, but it may not be the best. You need to think about it yourself. Um, regarding tangible personal property, if you're Mary here, don't worry about it. Technically, the stuff that's in your house all has to go through probate because it, you, you die and you're the owner, and so who gets it? But as a practical matter, nobody ever fights about that stuff. It just gets divided up. Most of it gets thrown away. Everything that you think your kids want, they don't. The Hummels, keep them. You know, they don't want this stuff anymore, right? So, so, so don't worry about that. The only other asset that you want to worry about is the car because the car has a title. And if you die, no one can buy that car without a title. And if you go to the registry to get a new title because you're dead, now someone has to go to probate and get appointed to be your representative so they can go and take care of the car, right? It's, a, it's one of the most common reasons why pro, it, probates inadvertently happen is the car. So the way that you deal with that is you name one of you, whoever's gonna get the car, right? You name one of your kids jointly with you on the car. And when they protest and say, but ma, you're a terrible driver, I don't want the liability, right? You just say, okay, we'll get some more insurance, right? You just buy yourself some more insurance. So that's the car. Finally, if you are Mary and you, and you want to avoid probate, um, but you don't want to lose control of the assets while you're alive, that's when you do a revocable and amendable trust. You've probably all heard of revocable and amendable trust. That's why you do them. You create a trust, you name yourself as the trustee, so you stay in control of all the assets. But you say you're, the, you're doing it for the benefit of yourself and your kids, and you say that following your death, that trust becomes irrevocable so that your kids can't change the rules. And following your death, you name a new trustee who's going to be your successor, right? And who's immediately going to be able to go in and divide up all the assets. And so it makes it really fast. You eliminate the lawyer. What you also eliminate is the creditors. So I have this other couple in Nantucket that I'm working with that they've got seven kids and everybody's grown up and they're all happy, right? That everybody went to college. Some of them became lawyers. Some of them were artists. The lawyers all paid off their student loans. The artists, not so much, right? So, and the parents co-signed on all the student loans. And so now they're all paying these like small payments to all the various educational loan thing, people, right? To slowly pay off the remaining $100,000 because there were several kids in student loans. And their only big asset is this house, which they bought for a couple hundred thousand dollars, but it's Nantucket, it's worth $2 million now. So I said, all you do is you put the house in the revocable trust, following your death, the new trustee steps in and divides up the assets. Creditors are all wiped out because the creditor claims, as I mentioned earlier, are only against the probate estate. So avoiding probate also avoids these lingering creditors. Or if you've got IRS issues, you know, some people have just got stuff that happened, right? That's how you wipe all those people out is by avoiding probate. Um, now, I'm going to tell you a little, about, a little bit about taxes. Every, what every single person needs to know about taxes. Not everything, but we'll say the important things that you need to know. First of all, there's no gift tax. There's no gift tax, right? So how many people here think that if you give away, if you give away more than $15,000 to someone in a particular year, something bad happens? Raise your hand. Have you ever heard that before? That there's this $15,000 thing and something bad happens if you give more than that away. The answer is that's all made up. That's all made up. That's a myth. It was true about 20 years ago. It's no longer true. So you can give away as much as you want anytime to any one of your kids and nothing bad happens. As a matter of fact, something good happens. And that is you actually reduce the size of your estate. But now we're going to talk about that a little bit. We're going to talk about avoiding the Massachusetts estate tax. Now to understand how to avoid it, you need to understand how it works and a little bit of the history. So here it is, everything you ever probably didn't even want to know about the Massachusetts estate tax. So Massachusetts estate tax was created about the same time as the federal estate tax, around the 1920s, at a time when there was this accumulation of wealth and this concern that, you know, why is it that just because I, got, I happen to be the child of a guy who, you know, hit it big, I get all the money and the rest of the society doesn't benefit in any way. So the Massachusetts estate tax was adopted then. Now at that time, $40,000 was a lot of money. Can you imagine back in the time, $40,000 was a lot of money, way more than the value of a house. I remember my folks bought their house in Marlboro in 1940 for $2,600. Could not figure out how they were gonna make the mortgage payments, right? They rented out the other half of the house to help them make the mortgage payments. So anyway, 
the, if, it, the, when the original estate tax was created, the government created a chart of how much you had to pay in estate tax, and it kicked, it kicked in at $40,000. So if you made more than 40, and it was a graduated tax, just like the federal income tax. So if you earned, if you had, the estate was between 40,000 and like 190,000, 190, you paid like 0.8% in tax. And, if it was, and, and for the money between 190 and like 300,000, you paid like 1.6% in tax. Really small tax rates, right? And it just kept on going, right? Right up to the large numbers. And that chart is still there, and it's still in effect. And for example, so if you're in Massachusetts, unless, but I'm gonna talk about one exception in a second, but according to the chart, if you die within a state of $100,000 today, you owe an estate tax of $560. If it's a $500,000 estate, you owe $12,400. Not really big numbers. If it's a million dollar estate, you owe $36,560. And if it's a million $100,000 estate, and remember that's how much Mar Mary's estate is, $1,100,000, it's $42,640. So over time, and so that's the chart, and it's still in effect. But what happened was over time, the values of things started you know, changing, and the value of houses, really, especially, really started going up, and it started happening that everybody was paying an estate tax. And so people went to their legislature and they said, oh, we, you gotta do something about this. So there were two possibilities. They could have changed the chart, but that would have taken a lot of work, right? So instead, they simply drew a line. They took that $40,000 line, that you know, if you have less than 40,000, you don't pay, and they just moved it. They said, okay, it's gonna be $100,000. And then they moved it again, it's gonna be 500, and then it was gonna be 600, and now it's a million. And now it's a million. So if you have an estate, a taxable estate, it's worth less than a million dollars, you don't pay any estate tax, despite the chart, right? Which then leads to the question, what if your estate is a million and one dollars, right? Now, in many states, and this was Rhode Island until about three years ago, they changed. Um, in many states, the estate tax was referred to as a cliff tax, that there was this exemption period, and if you were below the exemption, you didn't pay any tax, but then if you got a dollar over, you fell off the cliff, and you owed all the money that you were supposed to pay before, right? So Massachusetts didn't do that. Instead, what the Massachusetts people said, well, what we're gonna do is we're gonna, we're gonna have a little period during which you're gonna catch up to what you would have paid under the chart, and so, under the Massachusetts estate tax, if you have a taxable estate of more than a million dollars, you have to pay the lesser of one of two numbers, either the amount from the chart, which we saw, or 40% of all the dollars over a million dollars. So basically, through, as a, and, and so and for example, as a result of this, for Mary's estate, if Mary dies with an, an estate of $1.1 million, she has to do two calculations. First. What's the tax under the chart? Well, I already showed you that, right? $42,640. Second, what is 40% of all the dollars over a million? Well, 40% of $100,000, which is all the dollars over a million, is $40,000. So, using the 40% figure, she owes $40,000. Now, you take the lower one. So in Mary's case, in this case, she would owe $40,000 in estate tax because it's the lower of those two numbers. Now, as you can imagine, because the chart is taxing dollars at 40% or 40 cents on the dollar, or excuse me, the, 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 the alternative tax is taxing at 40%, 40 cents on the dollar, while the chart at this point is only taxing at about five cents on the dollar, fairly soon those two lines are gonna cross, and the amount of the chart is gonna exceed 40% of all the dollars over a million. As it happens, that line crosses at about a million two hundred thousand dollars. And after that, there is no benefit at all from the fact that you had an estate that, was, um, that had a million dollars in it. Now you're paying the number according to the chart, okay? So, as that affects Mary, Mary has several alternatives if she wants to avoid the estate tax. Now remember, the estate tax isn't a huge number, right? The estate tax is $40,000, but it's not nothing. And I have clients that will, I have a lot of clients that will tell me, I don't want to spend a dime giving it to the government. And I get that, right? So if that's your case, then you want to pay attention to this. Now, one way that Mary could avoid all of her estate tax is she could give all of her money away. 
Now, of course, she doesn't want to give all of her money away if she's fine and healthy and rolling along because she's got to live. And she doesn't want to give the money to her kids because she doesn't trust that they're going to give it back. Right? Or because she just doesn't want to have to call them all the time. But what she can do, remember, she could give one of those kids or more a power of attorney. Right? And she could tell them, look, if I get sick before I die, take all the money, divide it up three ways. Right? Because we got three kids. Just divide up the money. Give everything away. And as long as it happens the day before she dies, she's avoided the estate tax. And nothing bad happened as a result of this, right? Because there's no gift tax. And the receipt of a gift is an income. So it's the same thing as if you receive a bequest as a result of death. Uh, ex now, that's one, except in one case, and we're going to talk about that case. Uh, another way that she could do it, what you would think, is she, you, you, you would say, well, what if I just give away enough money to get myself down to that million dollars? Right? Because remember, the estate, estates of, of, of less than a million dollars don't pay any estate tax. Then I get to keep my million, and I've avoided the estate tax. Unfortunately, Mary can't do that in that particular way. This is the one and only place where that magic $15,000 that I was mentioning earlier is relevant. If she gives away money in that situation in increments of more than $15,000 to one person, the extra money gets added back into her estate when she dies. So she could do this. She could eliminate, she could also eliminate her estate tax, but the way she'd have to do it would be to take that extra $100,000 and give it away in increments of $15,000. So what she could tell her daughter, I'm always saying the daughter, because usually it's the daughter that does all this stuff, right? What she could tell her daughter is, so if I'm going to die and I still have a million one, just take every child and every grandchild of mine, right? Add them together, give everybody the same amount of money. Just give them all a check, right? And as long as everybody, nobody's receiving more than $15,000, and that wouldn't be many, right? right? All she has to, is to find like nine people who are gonna get a check. That'll keep all the checks below $15,000, right? Then she will have avoided the estate tax, which in her case is a big deal, because the estate tax is 40% of that $100,000. So if she can just give it away the day before she dies, she pays no estate tax. If she keeps it until the day she dies, she gives $40,000 to the government and she gives the other $60,000 away. See how that works? It's pretty amazing, isn't it? Right? So now to the exception. In Mary's case, the exception. What about the house? What about if she gives away the house? Now everything that I just said totally works. Just exactly as I said, in terms of eliminating the estate tax. But... What about the capital gains tax? Okay, so now a few words on capital gains. Uh, if Mary and Frank, and Frank had bought their house for $50,000, and they then turn around and sell it for its current sale price of $400,000, they will have a gain, a capital gain, of $350,000. The difference between sale price and basis. Basis in this case, that's a tax term. In this case, it means purchase price. There will be a capital gain of $350,000. And if it weren't their home, right, say it was their cottage on the Cape, right, they would pay a tax on that equal to about 20% of that gain, or about $70,000. Now, as it happens, because it's their home, um, and not specifically because it's their home, but as long as they've been living in, for two, in it for two of the previous five years, they get a capital gains exemption and their exemption is $500,000. And every time you buy a house and live in, in it for two years and go to sell it, you get another exemption of $500,000 if you're a couple. It doesn't apply just once, right? So they wouldn't pay an estate a, a capital gains tax. Now, for tax purposes, when Mary and Frank bought that house, that basis that they got, that $50,000, actually each of them got half of that as their basis. Mary got a basis of $25,000. Frank got a basis of fifty. dollars now, when you die and you own a piece of property that has a low basis, a magic thing happens. The basis jumps to the date of death value. It steps up. It's called stepped up basis. So if Frank dies, right? Remember the house is worth $400,000. So Frank's half of the house is worth $200,000. The moment he dies, his half, the basis jumps to $200,000. But now Mary owns the house, so what's her basis? Well, her basis is that 200000 that she just inherited, right? 
Frank's new basis plus her old 25. So her basis in the house now is $225,000. If she sells the house the next day for $400,000, if it were a cottage, she would pay a capital gains tax. How much? 400 minus 225, that's the new basis, equals $175,000, that's the gain. 20% of that, 20% of $175,000, or around $35,000, actually exactly $35,000, is what she would pay in capital gains tax, right? Now, she has an exemption though. Remember, there's that exemption because she's been living in the house. Her exemption is 250, it's bigger than the capital gain. So once again, she doesn't pay any tax. But what about if she gives the house to the kids? Or what about if the parents both give the house to the kids? When you give a property that is appreciated in value, you, you're giving that person your basis. Your ba there's no tax that is owed at the time, but the new owner ends up with the same basis that you had. So if she, they gave their house to, to Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. And then Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. sold the house, whether before or after they died, wouldn't make any difference, they're gonna pay an, a capital gains tax of, of uh, $70,000 because they're gonna pay the capital gain on the difference between $400,000 and the $50,000, right? So going back to the, the question of should Frank and should Mary give away all of her assets before she dies? What she may wanna do is give away everything else. Remember she had a total of a million one in assets, but the house is worth 400,000, so there's another 700,000. She may want to give away that 700,000, thereby just leaving her with the house. She may end up with a small capital gains tax, because if she just has the house, there's going to be an, or excuse me, she may end up with a small estate tax, because if she still has the house, there may be a small estate tax, right? But it's going to be way lower than the amount that her kids save when they sell the house on capital gain, for capital gains purposes. So that's really, I don't want to say it's everything you need to know, but it's everything that you really feel like listening to today, right? So, but those are, those are, those are, it's, the, the gift thing is the main thing for you to remember, that you can, you can always just give it away, right? So, the other thing that Mary wants to make sure of is that she does not run out of money before she dies. Because after she dies, she doesn't really care, right? And just, she just doesn't care, right? There are a lot of theories about what happens after you die, and none of them are you worried about how much money you had the day before you died, right? So, there are several things she may want to do, though, to prepare for that, right? One is to get a reverse mortgage. I've talked about this before to semin seminars. People always look at me, they, oh, reverse mortgage, oh my God, that'd be terrible. Why, they take your house. No, they don't take your house. So, briefly, briefly, and the reason why Mary would want to look at having a reverse mortgage is if she wants to know, even though she's got quite a bit of cash, right? In this situation, she's got 700,000 in cash. But suppose the asset were just her house. Suppose she only had 100,000 in cash. This is not uncommon, right? She's living on social security, mortgage is paid, but how do, they keep, how do you keep up a house knowing that your entire reserve is this little tiny amount of money? Or maybe she's worried that as time goes on, she may need care at home. She may need home care. And she hasn't bought long-term care insurance. So what, what I suggest to people in that case is go get yourself a reverse mortgage. What is a reverse mortgage? A reverse mortgage is a home equity loan where you don't have to make the monthly payments. What is a home equity loan? You go to the bank and you say, here's my house. It's worth $400,000. The bank will typically look at that house and say, okay, we will lend you a percentage of that value. It's a loan to value ratio. Um, and we, and the, it'll tell you, it's always the same, whatever the, for that bank, they'll have a policy. But, they, but they don't, you don't get the money right away unless you want it. What you do is you sign a line of credit loan with the, the bank. You sign a promise to pay the bank back whatever you've borrowed, right? And if you don't borrow it, you don't owe them any money. And if you do borrow some of it, you don't owe any money until you've borrowed it, and you don't owe any interest until you've borrowed it. But once you've borrowed it, you start paying interest on that amount of money, except that you have to pay the interest payments in monthly payments. Now that, that home equity loan is due uh, when you sell the house, or when you die, that's always, that's always an automatic default under the mortgage, right? Um, or if you fail to make one of these payments, right, the monthly, interest payments, right? So what is a reverse mortgage? It is, I don't know if I explain it more here. No, what is a reverse mortgage? It's that exact same thing, except first of all, the way the bank figures out how much money to give you is they take the value of your house and they take your age. 
and it's going to be a percentage of the value of the house based on your age and the percentage keeps going up the older you get. So if you're 62, which is the youngest you can get a reverse mortgage, that, that, that was going to be about 40%. If you're 85, that percentage is going to be about 60% around. So, and you don't owe any money if you just do the reverse mortgage and don't borrow any yet, right? When you do take it out, from that point on, interest starts getting charged on that piece, right? So for example, say you're Frank and Mary and you've got a $400,000 house and you're 80 years old. In that case, you can, you're going to be eligible for around $200,000. Say you borrow $30,000 and the interest rate is 5%. You're going to owe interest from the day you, owe, you buy the, borrow the $30,000 at 5%. What's, what's 5% of $30,000? It is $1,500 approximately divided by 12 months, right? So your interest is going to be a little over $100 a month. What happens if you don't make an interest payment? All that happens, nothing happens. All that happens is the $100 that you were supposed to pay in interest gets added to the $30,000 that you, that you borrowed in the first place. And then the following month, your interest is calculated based on $30,100 as opposed to being based on $30,000. That's the reason why the amount grows if you're not making the interest payment. You always can make the interest payment if you want. But the main thing is you don't have to. So if you're that older person, who wants to stay in their home, but they don't have great income, and something bad happens to the house, now you can just write the check. You know, the septic system goes, the roof goes, whatever. Or you really want to stay in your house, right? You want to live in your house until you die. But you can't unless you get some home care and your daughter doesn't live close enough, you know, or for whatever, or doesn't make it because she's working. So you need somebody to be there with you in the morning to help you get going, right? Or at night, you need somebody, but that's gonna cost you, not a huge amount per, per hour, maybe $25 an hour, but it adds up, $25 an hour, you know, 10 hours, you know, going rates $25 an hour, right? For 10 hours a week, that's 250, you know, times 50 weeks, all of a sudden it's real money. So if you're in that situation, the earlier you can get that reverse mortgage in place, just to know that it's there. So you can always borrow it. If it helps you sleep at night, then do it. So that's the reverse mortgage. Uh, I talked about all of that. You can also defer the taxes on your house. Who knew? If you, if you are living in the house and you're 62 years old or older, and you've been living in South Bro for at least five years, and you've been living in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts for at least 10 years, you can defer, you can tell the tax folks that you don't want to pay your taxes anymore. And they are required to give you a reverse mortgage basically and say, okay, your taxes won't be owed until you die or until you sell the house and we're going to, we're going to charge you interest on that. Now, I was lazy and didn't go to the assessor's office and didn't check what the amount is. Do you know, do you know how much, what, what, what the amount of income you can have to qualify in, in, in South Pro? No, I don't. I'm going to have it on the TV show. I'm going to make sure that we put that as a banner. We'll put that in, this, in that blank. As I said, I, I ran out of time. I didn't get to the... Because the, 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 the state says that, that there is... That, that this will only apply if you, if you make less than a particular income amount. The state says that that income amount cannot be less than $20,000. So everybody that has just income of $20,000 automatically qualifies. It can't be greater than a particular amount according to a formula which turns out to be about $70,000. And many communities are a lot closer to the $70,000 figure than they are to the 20 in terms of what they allow you to have as income and still qualify for this. So if you're really wondering about this, you have my email contact information, email me and I'll email it back to you or watch the show when it's on cable, okay? I'll have that number. So once again, for many of my clients, the tax bill is the second biggest bill they have next to the food bill. And so by, if by deferring that tax bill, you can keep, stay in your house, you know, why not? Um, a couple of other things. You should think about getting long-term care insurance. Really, that only works if you're under 70. If you're over 70, you have to be really healthy to buy long-term care insurance. But as I say to folks, the reason why you get it, if you can, is not to pay for the nursing home. The nursing home costs so much that the premium to buy a big long-term care insurance policy is going to kind of overwhelm you, right? But what it really is good for is for paying that home, for that home care. Suppose you do want to stay at home and you need a little bit of help. Say you need six hours a day. Now that's a lot of help. Six hours a day. 
you buy a, pol a long-term care insurance policy that pays $150 a day, that's six hours a day, right? So now you know that if you need it, if you need that extra assistance without dipping into your savings, you know that it's gonna be there. Long-term care insurance, great, a great idea. Not that huge policy, but that smaller one. I'm not gonna talk about the state-funded policies. The other thing you wanna do is call Bay Path Elder Services. How many of you are, 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 are clients of Bay Path Elder Services? Raise your hand. None. How many of you know what Bay Path Elder Services is? So there is Bay Path Elder Services. The state is divided into 27 regions, actually 26, 26 regions. And each region is serviced by a nonprofit entity that is basically the funnel through which all federal and state money for seniors comes. Uh, the most common example that everybody knows of this is Meals on Wheels. One of the reasons for the creation of these entities was back in the 60s in, the, in the, the creation of the Older Americans Act. They are the administrating entity for Meals on Wheels, right? Um, so, yes? Um, the, the income is 40,000. So, the, so the, 40. ah, instead of 20. So if you have income of less than $40,000 and you own a home, you can get all of your taxes deferred until you die, right? Now, there are no asset limits. Well, there are never any, and that's the point. There are never any asset limits on that one. So Mary could do that. Mary could qualify in South Pro to have all of her taxes deferred until she died, right? Which, given Mary's income, may be a big deal for Mary. So, I'm sorry, I, I lost my place. So, Bay Path Elder Services, what you ought to do as a senior is just call them and say, I'm a senior, I live in South Pro. Bay Path Elder Services, is a, once again, it's a nonprofit. They're not gonna charge you anything, right? They're only gonna tell you what state programs are available that you may be interested in, right? If there's a, sometimes there are income-based programs in which there'd be a copay, right? But the great thing about just signing up with BayPath is that that no, means they know you exist. So that if there's an emergency and you need to talk to them about substantial programs, you don't have to go sign up, right? You're already in the computer. And they can say, oh yeah, so we'll send somebody right over. It's a big deal. And their offices are right in now. Uh, a lot of times you can just sign up over the phone uh, or their offices are right over here in, in, uh, in Marlboro. So it's a great idea. Uh, staying at home if you really need a lot of help. If you need a lot of help, like six, eight, ten hours a day of help uh, at home in order to be able to stay at home, and you, and then you qualify, and you, and the reason why you need that help is because you can show to Bay Path Elder Services, which is the certifying agency, that you need help with at least two of the activities of daily living, regular physical health with either dressing, eating, bathing, toileting, transferring, any two of those five. Or if you've got some real memory issues, so you really need to have somebody around the house in order for it to be safe for you to be there, then you can qualify for this program. It's called the Frail Elder Waiver Program. It is designed for people. How many people here, I'm not even gonna ask, never wanna go to a nursing home? I bet there's a lot of those, right? So it's designed for people who never wanna go to a nursing home where they may be in a situation because of physical or memory issues that in order to avoid going a nurse to a nursing home, they need a lot of care at home. Because not only do you not want to go to the nursing home, Mass Health doesn't want you to go. Because if you do, they're going to pay a boatload of money to that nursing home. So they'd much rather keep you at home, which is why they created the Frail Elder Waiver Program. Now, uh, you need to, to, to qualify, you need to show that you need assistance with at least two of those activities of daily living or that you've got a lot of, of, of memory issues. Um, you also need to show there's an asset limit on this program, right? And it's low, $2,000 in countable assets. Now, for this program, the house is not a countable asset. So, but in Mary's case, she's got all this other cash, right? She's got $700,000 in cash. What does she do? Well, one possibility, and we're gonna, we're gonna talk about that. Actually, we'll talk about that now. Uh, yeah, one possibility, she could actually still qualify by doing one of two things or both of these things with that money. She could use, she can either use some of the money to buy an annuity, and as long as that annuity calls for equal monthly payments over a term that is shorter than her life expectancy, buying that annuity in any amount legitimately converts assets to an income stream. The other thing she can do is she can call and, and sign up for a D4C pooled trust. Raise your hand if you've ever heard of that. I bet nobody, usually it's, ah, one, ah but Cindy comes all the time. So, so there are these wonderful things called D4C pool trusts. 
Uh, there are five of them in Massachusetts. They're called D4Cs for a reason you don't want to know. So the, the D4C pooled trust. If you want to learn more about them, Google pooled trust, P-O-O-L-E-D, pooled trust. The concept is these are organi they're all run by nonprofits, the, these trusts are, for the benefit of elderly and disabled people. And the way it works is that you can give them any amount of money, as long as you're disabled, right, in which you would be in this case, right? You can give them any amount of money. And what they will do with it is they will pool it with all their other money, hence the name, pooled trusts. But then they're going to keep track of your money, and you'll earn interest on it and all that jazz. And then if you need it for anything, they'll, they'll give it to you, or they'll buy whatever you need. They won't give you cash back, but they'll buy whatever you need. And under mass health regulations, no matter how much you transfer to those folks, the day after you transfer it, the money, it's no longer countable for purposes of qualifying for, among other things, the frail elder waiver or qualifying for the nursing home benefit. But we're just talking about the frail elder waiver. So Mary could literally transfer all this money to the D4C pool trust today and tomorrow qualify for the frail elder waiver. Once she's done that, then Baypath will come back to her house figure out how many hours of care she needs, up to about 40 or 50 hours a week, uh, and MassHealth will pay for it. Now, MassHealth will have a, a lien on the D4C money after Mary dies to get reimbursed for some amount. But the amount that they're going to pay for the home care is much lower than the amount that you're going to pay for if you're paying it privately. So Mary ends up saving a lot of money in the long run, and in the short run, knows that she can get home care for the rest of her life, you know, and, and, and she's going to be able to stay at home. That's the goal, being able to stay at home. A uh, couple of other things. If you're trying to qualify for that program, um, there is a deductible. There is an income deductible. And, and the in income deductible, it moves with inflation, but right now it's $2,250 per month, right? Now, Mary would actually be, be okay with this, right? But, but if you go over the deduct, and if you're below that income deductible, then everything I just said is true. MassHealth will provide all of those hours of pay and blah, 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 right? You would think that if you were over this by like a dollar, right, the magic number, that your deductible would be a dollar. So that if you, own, if you earn $2,251 every month, you could pay the dollar deductible in, and then you could still get covered by MassHealth. That's not how it works. Instead, if you're a dollar over, your deductible ends up equaling all of your income minus about $500, or minus about $600. So in Mary's case, her income is about $2,500 a month. If her income is $2,500 a month, her deductible is going to be $1,900 a month. So she's going to need to be able to show that she is spending on home care, at home, $1,900 a month before MassHealth will kick in. That's a lot. So, so for that person, she needs to be needing a lot of home care. And then how in the world does she pay that? Well, one way would be, remember we just talked about the D4C. She puts all the money in, her D, in the D4C, she then qualifies, but if she's over income, the, you know, the, uh, the MassHealth says, oh, you gotta pay you know, $2,000 a month in, in home care. And so the D4C pays that. And then MassHealth kicks in and pays for another 40 or 50 hours worth of home care. Another way that she can do it is with, if she had a reverse mortgage. She could pull out some of those assets in order to pay for the home care. Another way would be if she had long-term care insurance. A lot of times people will use both MassHealth, especially if you need like 24-hour care. Um, then, and the, it may very well be that the combination of MassHealth and the long-term care insurance will allow you to have 24-hour care. Right? So there are all those alternatives. If you need assist, if you're a senior, you want to live in your house until you die. I totally get that, right? But what if you can't? What if it is just not physically safe for you anymore, and you know that, right? Sometimes you don't want to know it, but you just know it, you know? That the chances of you falling down and breaking your hip and therefore ending up in a nursing home, the dreaded nursing home, right, is much higher a lot of times if you're at home because you can't there's certain you know the home is going to have stairs just going to have stairs and home is going to have snow you know it just is right there's, there's going to be snow outside right whereas in an assisted living community um there isn't any snow well there is but it's all way outside because you can live inside because it's big enough so for many people this what you should do what you should do as you get older 
is look around at some of these places. Just automatically, just say to yourself, I'm over 80, I just need to know how these things look. And go look around and see if one of these is a place where if you did fall down or whatever and you ended up in the hospital and you didn't want them to discharge you to the nursing home, you'd say, ah, discharge me over here to the Highlands. You know, I'd really rather go to the Highlands than to the nursing home, right? So you want to kind of look and see if there's one of these places that you would like living. Now, the problem with, one, with these places, right, is that they cost money. I get that, right? They're going to cost somewhere between, you're going to think, like $7,000 a month. The Highlands, and this, isn't, this is kind of an ad for the Highlands because I think it's really good, but if you want a, a sense of what you, what you can look at, go look at the Highlands down on Route 30 in, in Westboro. And I think they charge for a per, an individual less than $4,000 a month, right? And what are you getting? You're getting all your food, right? You can, get, you can bring your car there if you want to, but you really don't need it. I mean, they got a great van shuttle, right? And so all of your like overhead, the house taxes, the more, all, all of the insurance, it all goes, right? And, and I'm just going to mention this. If, if you, if you uh, that's not what I wanted to do. Um, if you um, are a veteran, or if your spouse was a veteran, and you go to um, an assisted living, and, and, and part of the bill of the assisted living is the bill for paying for this assistance, right, with the activities of daily living, then, then you may be entitled to, if you're a veteran, up to about $2,000 a month to cover that bill, or if you're the widow of a veteran, about $1,000 a month. So now instead of having a bill for $5,000 a month, suddenly it's $4,000 or $3,000. This is the reason why I was told by a, a friend who does a lot of this kind of work. There's a wonderful woman named Patty Surveys who knows just everything about this benefit. Whenever people call us, we just say, go talk to Patty. But she told me that I think the figure is that something like 70% of all the people living in assisted living uh, are getting this benefit. That's the reason why they can afford it. Right? Na this is nationally. nationally. So, they're, they're real, they're, so I'm just saying... You need to figure it out. I'll just mention one other thing now about the assisted livings. If you do need that assistance with the activities of daily living or you've got you know, some real memory problems and your doctor says that you need to be in that community, then the monthly payments to the assisted living are tax deductible. They're a federal tax deduction. So if you're in a situation like Mary where you've got a lot of money that's in a tax deferred account, you know, like $150,000, but the hundred fifty dollars really isn't yours, right? Because you can't get it until you pay the taxes, and the taxes are going to be a lot. Well, now you're not going to be paying any tax on that money because you're going to take the money out of the IRA, and you're going to go pay it to the assisted living, which is, and it's going to match up, right? So almost the entire amount that you take out of the IRA is going to be a medical deduction, and you're probably going to end up not paying any money in taxes. So it's a place where you can use that tax-deferred money 100%. There are a few other things I was going to talk about regarding nursing homes. I'm just going to talk about this one last thing. So, this is the one that you all know about. So I wasn't going to talk about it for a whole lot. If you want to protect yourself because you're afraid you're going to go into a nursing home and you've got all these assets and you're married, there is only one way to protect the assets, right? You've got to transfer them out of your name. You've got to wait five years. Remember, you can just give them to your kids if you want or to anybody else because there's no gift tax involved, right? You can just transfer the assets. And if you've got one child and you really trust him and you know that he doesn't get a big creditor problem or a divorce problem, you can just give him the money. If you've got many children and you're afraid they're all going to fight about this, then what you usually do is you create an irrevocable trust. You name one of the kids as the trustee for the benefit of the others and you transfer assets to that child. And then you have to wait five years and that's when the assets are protected. I've done, I do longer presentations on that. You've all heard that before. You all kind of know that that's the case, so I didn't want to spend a lot of time on it. So, that's it. Uh, that's all irrevocable trust stuff and it's boring. Um, we did that. Oh, one, I'm sorry, one final thing. One final thing. So say everything has been, everything's bad, right? And, you've, and, you've gone, and you have to go to the nursing home, right? And that's really terrible. And you didn't do any planning. Or you're taking care of somebody who didn't do any planning, right? Who's a single person. And, and you're like, it's your aunt or your sister or whatever. And, and they're like, and, and so now, and you're the one that's in charge because you have the power of attorney, right? And you're starting to write these big checks. And you say to yourself, there's nothing I can do. Well, there is. There is. And you want to do it. 
That person can always qualify for Mass Health. You can always qualify for Mass Health because you can always take the assets that you have and either buy an annuity with them or put them into the D4C pool trust. Now, in either of those cases, Mass Health is going to have a lien on that money to get repaid following your death or following that person's death. So you'd say, why bother doing it? And the answer is this. If you're on private pay in a nursing home around here, remember Mary's, say Mary's uh, income is about $2,500, right? That's what it was actually, Social Security and pension per month. Say the nursing home cost is $14,500. That's a, that's a little high, but not real high. There are nursing homes, there's one in Framingham that charges that, right? There's a lot, that, that's where it's going. Say it's $14,500 because it makes the math easier, right? And Mary is on private pay, right? Paying her income of $2,500 every month. That means for her to stay in that nursing home, she also has to burn away, that's why it was called the burn rate, $12,000 a month in her savings until she owns nothing but the house, at which point Mass Health will qualify her but put a lien on the house. Once she's on Mass Health, though, that very same bed in that very same nursing home is going to be billed at the Mass Health rate, at the Mass Health rate, which isn't $14,500 a month. It varies nursing home to nursing home, but it's around $6,500 around. So the day that Mary qualifies for Mass Health, the burn rate on her money, even if Mass Health has a lien on the D4C or on these assets that she, that she converted to qualify for Mass Health, the burn rate, the amount they're going to get paid back, is the difference between the, the 12,000 the, 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 uh, 12, per month that she's paying on private pay and the 4,000 a month that she's paying if she's on Mass Health for a savings of $8,000 a month or $96,000 a year. So she always wants to be on Mass Health. Always, always. Well, not totally always. So if you're going into the nursing home, you got nothing but tax deferred money, right? And you're not going to live for very long. Well, in that case, maybe you don't want to cash in all the tax deferred money, pay the tax, and therefore do this. Because so the tax loss may overwhelm the benefit. If you're going to be in a nursing home for any kind of significant amount of time, though, you always want to qualify for Mass Health, and you always can, even if you're single. Thank you very much. Any questions? Thank you very much for coming. Enjoy the summer. We'll see you in the fall. Thank you very much.